Hope Unlimited Church, thank you so much for joining our special Independence Day service today. It's so good to see you all here. Won't you take a moment and wish somebody a happy Independence Day? We are all so very glad to welcome all our family watching us online. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. We believe this service is going to be a blessing to you and your family. Well, if you have any prayer requests, you can click on the live prayer button and our prayer partners are ready to pray with you and believe with you for your miracles. And our family, on campus, there's a prayer request card in the pouch in front of you that you can fill it out and hand it over to our ushers or put it in the offering bag during the service. And our pastors will be praying for you during the service. Well, even as we celebrate 75 years of freedom in this country, I just wanted to remind us all of a freedom that is much, much greater and is only found in Jesus. I don't know where in life you are at. Maybe you're battling something that you cannot share with people. Maybe it is a sin issue. Maybe it's your past failure. It's a physical, mental, spiritual, whatever it is that you're battling today. Let me remind you that Jesus has won it all on the cross and he bought you your freedom. And if you have never experienced that, today is your day to encounter that freedom in Christ. Even as we praise and celebrate that grift of freedom that we found in Jesus. Shall we put our hands together, church? Come on. Let's lift up a shout of praise today. Let me out of the desert. Brought me into a stream, river of living water. Turn my bitter into sweet. All my burdens are lifted. Take the shackles off my feet.
on, church. The Bible says there's freedom in the name of Jesus. Come on, do you believe it, church? Come on, put your hands together. Even as we sing this next song, declare it with faith. that you release freedom to our nation, to our city, Father. We 
Leben zu führen.
I'm just going to encourage you to take, a, to take a step of faith this afternoon and declare his freedom or any area of your life that you have fear. Just declare his freedom. Come on, can I ask everybody to just lift your hands? Just think about those things. Think about those areas in your life where fear is gripping you and declare his freedom. And God is going to pour out his freedom. God is going to give that freedom. Because you and I are sons and daughters. He calls your child. And he wants to live. He wants you to live in freedom. church these are just not some words to sing today but this is the truth and the reality in Jesus that we are no longer slaves we are no longer slaves but we are the children of the most high God do you believe that church come on if you believe it won't you just simply lift up your hands to heaven today to say thank you God that you call me your son son and a daughter is that you have access to everything that the father has God the father doesn't hold back anything from his children and tonight I just feel the love of the father in this place for everyone who feels that you don't have access to his presence you don't have access to what his blessings truth today is you have it because he calls you the son of his daughter.
take the broken and raise them to glory. You are my champion, giants fall and you stand up defeated every battle. Church, you have the authority. You have the authority. Jesus has given you that authority. You're not a slave. You're not a servant. You and I are sons and daughters. And he says, I've given you authority. And can we pray today? Father, we just want to thank you, God, that we can come boldly into your throne of grace and mercy and say, Abba, Father. We come as sons and daughters, not as slaves, not as 
bonded servants, but we come as your children today, God. And Father, we take authority over every fear, God, over our lives. Every lie of the enemy, God, that is intimidating us, oh God. Everything that is limiting us, oh God. Every bondage that we are stuck in, God. Everything that says you cannot and you will not. Father, we break off the lies of the enemy in the name of Jesus right now. Right now, Lord. And Father, we speak freedom, Lord. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So we pray and speak freedom. Freedom to dream again. Freedom to, Lord, believe you, God. Every lie of the enemy right now, God, I tear it down in Jesus' name. And God, I pray, let hope arise in the name of Jesus, God. Lord, every one of us that is here, God, let hope arise. We pray right now, God, for these requests, God. We pray and we take authority of the spirit of cancer, God. And in the name of Jesus, God, we cancel its effect, Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray for deaths to be cleared in Jesus' name. Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh, God. You are more than enough. You're always enough, God. So we pray supernatural doors to be opened in Jesus' name, oh God. And we thank you, God. And God, this morning, we celebrate our Independence Day, God. And Lord, we're so grateful to be a part of this amazing nation, God. Lord, that we are citizens of India, God. And we pray, Spirit of God, for your spirit to fall upon our nation in Jesus' name. We pray for our leaders, God. We pray for our prime minister. We pray for our president. We pray for our cabinet ministers, God. We pray, God, for the wisdom of God. We pray for the mind of Christ upon them, God. And Father, I pray, God, that you will visit our land in Jesus' name. So we pray that each one of us in this land will experience true freedom. And true freedom is knowing who you are and walking in that, Lord. So, Father, we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. we can lean into you in new ways, different ways today. To truly believe the Father that you will continue to come alive in our hearts and our minds. That you would awaken us, Father. Quicken us, as your word declares. And we're a grateful people today. Grateful for the freedoms that this nation affords us. The freedom of worship freedom that, Father, that we have to live a life unto you and to others in the mystery and amazing quality of your love. So I guess that's really on my heart's cry, that your love would come alive in all of us. In 
in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have your seats. Again, thank you for joining us today. Really glad that you tuned in to Hope Unlimited Church for all of you online. And uh, for all of you who are here, and just before I jump into my message, I'm curious to know uh, who will be worshiping with us for the very first time at Hope Unlimited Church. If I could have you raise your hands if you're with us for well, a number of you. Can I ask you to stand to your feet? We've got a gift bag that we'd love to put in your hands. We uh, really love to have you out. Thank you so much for giving some time on Independence Day. You men giving up part of your cricket. That's awesome. Thank you for that. <laughs> There's a person right down here in uh, the front. Thank you. And there should be a uh, welcome card. And if you could fill that out and take it downstairs, I believe there are other things we'd love to put in uh, your hands. So thank you again for uh, coming out. Well, it is uh, my nature when days like uh, today uh, uh, arise, uh, Independence Day, I, I like to reflect, do some reading. Uh, I'm a great student of, of history, uh, love uh, the history around the this nation, of course, in particular, where I've uh, now lived 37 years, hard to believe. I'm not that old, I really, I mean, it's just, but, anyway. so, but um, just want to encourage you, if you've never read the book by E. Stanley Jones, The Christ of the Indian Road, um, it kind of parallels India's independence. It was uh, written in the uh, uh, late 1930s, actually, but uh, some of you may know E. Stanley Jones was um, a great friend of the Prime Minister, uh, first Prime Minister, Nehru. Um, when Mahatma Gandhi passed away, one of the first persons that was asked to write a biography of his life was E. Stanley Jones because he knew him so well. He, uh, they were very close friends. Um, and uh, some of this unpacking, um, and in fact, that's another book I would encourage you to read, the biography of Mahatma Gandhi by E. Stanley Jones that gives such great insight from uh, a Christian perspective, from the church perspective uh, during these early days of uh, independence and, um, and, and so much uh, more. Um, uh, it it's always fascinates me how God orchestrates things or how things just uh, happen, uh, partly by design, partially by accident, partly because of convenience. Uh, I, I'm thinking that, you know, we celebrate Independence Day on August the 15th, um, largely because it was convenient to Lord Mountbatten uh, and his schedule. Uh, I'm sure most of you probably are aware of that. But back in the, in fact, as early as uh, in the 1920s, uh, the, the Congress Party was working towards um, what is now Republic Day, January the 26th, that is going to be the independence of India, but it got rewritten. And then, of course, we recognize, uh, I'm sure if you've been following the news, that um, uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi um, decided to make yesterday the 14th also a, a holiday, a day of remembrance, uh, where we remember the atrocities of partition and, and all what happened and, and the, you know, the, you know the, 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 the ugly side of... of uh, of what you and I are afforded in, in the freedom um, today. And, and again, uh, Pakistan celebrates uh, the 14th largely, so Mountbatten could be there in Pakistan on the 14th and be in India on the 15th. And, and it's just interesting to me how history unfolds itself, amen? Uh, and it's unique and it's different and sometimes very complex, but it absolutely cause, comes to us as a, a, a tremendous cost uh, um, of so many lives. Um, to intertwine that with, uh, you know, all of what Mahatma Gandhi did, but then you read the writings uh, around uh, the life of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, and of course he had no way, another way of trying to get freedom for India, isn't that right? And again, that's all part of the, the story, it's all part of the, the narrative uh, of things, and, and to think that uh, our flag is, uh, you know, largely produced out of a guy from all of our area, Telugu speaking, much Putnam, I believe he was from, um, and that's how we got... Uh, or the designer of the Indian flag, to think that Tagore, uh, although he penned things much earlier, that uh, the song, in fact, will be singing at the close of the service, the national anthem, um, and, and all that came about from a Bengali, and so from the north to the south, and, and so forth. And I want to talk a little bit about the complexities of all, what all that represents, some of the outcomes of our own uh, doing and not doing, our, our intentionality as well as our passiveness, and certainly... Uh, how you and I choose to live our life in the lens of the kingdom, uh, but yet in the lens of responsible citizenship. And, and I think that if we're honest with ourselves as we think about um, the great diversity, I mean, that's one of the wonderful things of this nation is diversity. 
uh, in terms of its culture, its faith, uh, and so forth. But I, I want to read a, a couple of things. Um, uh, part of my reading this last week was um, a research that was done by uh, the Pew Foundation, which is probably the global's larger, largest uh, research entity, right? Uh, and they've got great stuff. And, and they did a 30,000-person survey from November 2019 to March. So just before the first COVID uh, thing hit, they went to, uh, they did it in 17 languages across uh, over 17 states. Um, it's one of the most exhaustive surveys um, on Indian citizenship and so forth ever done. And the results of that were released just a matter of months ago. And, and it was interesting to me because one of the things they began to ask um, citizens was, did they feel they have religious freedom? Um, and one of the questions was, in fact, um, are you free to practice your faith? And I found the results a little bit surprising, to be, um, to be honest with you. Um, for amongst the Hindus, it was 91%. Amongst the Muslims, it was 89%. Amongst Christians, again, same, 89%. Sikhs, 82 Buddhists, 93 Jains, um, 85%. And so I guess I was surprised about the fact that most everybody, and this, this speaks to the tolerance of this nation, that felt like they were free to worship in their own faith. Now, obviously, it gets more complex the more that you ask other questions and, and understand what that means. And, and one of the other questions was, um, respecting all religions is important to you as it relates to citizenship. So in other words, part of the character above, about being Indian would be my respect towards other faiths. Uh, for the Hindus, they're at the top, 85%. To the Muslims, 78%. To the Sikhs, 81%. Buddhists, 84 Jains, 83 And the Christians are at the bottom of that percentage at 76 which really, again, surprised me that we wouldn't respect other people's faith as much as their faith respects us. And then another question they asked was, respecting other religions is very important or a very important part of your religious or your faith identity. And again, at the very top would be, well, actually, it's the Buddhists who believe it the most, then Hindus at 80%, Muslims at 79%, Christians at 78%, Sikhs at 75 and Jains at 73%. It goes on about values and other things. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this into the Hope You See website so you can uh, educate and learn from this uh, yourself. It was also very interesting to me when they began to talk about conflict with neighbors of different faiths. And again, what surprised me the, the most is the way that I think sometimes you and I feel like we're perceived. And it's actually the other way around that we have a more of a tension with the, our Hindu neighbor than the Hindu neighbor has with you. And I bring this up because I think to build anything meaningful, to build a marriage, to build a healthy relationship with your heavenly father, certainly to build out a family or live in community with one another, learning how to Manage conflict is so important. And a key at overcoming conflict would be at the core of our own prejudices. And you and I have prejudices. And it was interesting. I, this, this last week, I had leaders from all over the country gather in um, Hyderabad for a two-day conference uh, on a project that I've been working on with the Billy Graham Association since 2004 and, and onwards. And and obviously, because uh, of today, um, uh, technology is a whole lot different from 2004, right? Where we didn't have, uh, you know, Facebook and YouTube and, and the rest of it, right? So, so we're trying to, to up our game a bit and in our connectivity. And so, so I am not going to go into that. But it was interesting and just, again, fellowshipping and hearing from others. And I was really um, uh, taken back when, with, when somebody from Nagaland, when we were just talking, they said, well, 
you know, we celebrate our Independence Day on August 14th. And I said, well, that's strange. I mean, that was like, really, <laughs> well, that's what your neighbors went. Because at that time of independence, as, as the forefathers were trying to figure things out and partitions could still happen, we, we still had a, a lot of stuff to figure out, right? I mean, you had three different princely states, three of the 565 or 563 or whatever that exact numbers of the princely states of India were still making choices about alignment and where they're going to be. And of course, one of the biggest ones was the Hyderabad state, right? And we all know that, you know, the police conflict in 1950 and, you know, all the changes there. The Portuguese ran go until 1961 and there was tension there and how we're going to be and what does citizenship uh, uh, look like. Uh, obviously, we knew all of Jammu and Kashmir and, and all that princely state is, you know, kind of working itself out. And just because we all gain freedom or independence, there's a lot to figure out. Amen? In fact, we could say we're still trying to figure this stuff out a little bit. But I'm thankful, and even now as, as governments continue to figure out even how we manage our lives during this pandemic, there's different types of leadership, and I'm grateful that we live in a state where we can gather, amen, where we can have a church and gather ourselves together, which they're not doing right now in Maharashtra and West Bengal and, and other states, you know, and so be thankful for your freedoms. Be, be thankful for all of what you're provided, but to recognize there's still tension, there's ideas, and, and because of its great diversity, both uh, linguistically, culturally, of uh, faith, um, we all have prejudices. We have all these, these things going on, and, and my concern is, as I, I talk to church leaders all across this country, and this is one of my great privileges. I've been able to connect, um, uh, not just India, but mostly all over India with, with other leaders of faith. In fact, I just flew in last night. I was in uh, Delhi for a couple of days speaking at a, some Independence Day uh, functions uh, in the national capital and, and uh, just, again, having time with national leaders and, and, and working things out. And how many of you know that worship looks a little bit different in a village of Bihar than it does here in our church in Hyderabad? <laughs> you know, so, and we have these, you know, cultural values and other things that, you know, we're all, though I hope and, and believe, living a, a life of love and faith towards one another. But as much as we want to do that, I don't know that we're doing it really well. And in fact, I think oftentimes our, our prejudices, our, um, the way that we think about things that I think oftentimes are, are a bit misplaced, it gets in the way of seeing God's love come to all mankind. And yet that's exactly what God desires. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, God has revealed his grace to save the whole human race. And that's... That's his desire. God has never made a person that he doesn't love. And I think sometimes we forget, even in the lostness of somebody, God's love for that person is as great as it is towards you. God's love is as great for every one of us who are in his family as outside his family. Because he's never created a single person he didn't love or didn't desire to be unto himself. And this is the challenge for all of us to be a part of the, the story of offering up a reconciliation and freedom that can only be found in God's love through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and I just want to say reconciliation isn't some minor issue. It is a big issue with God. It is the biggest thing with God. And in fact, it's the one ministry he's given to all of us, the ministry of reconciliation, which is the bedrock of creating healthy relationships, which has everything to do with your life with the Father, has everything to do with your marriage and your family, and it has everything to do with your citizenship. To be a reconciler, to be a part of not just God's desire, but that there would truly be peace in the land and harmony to be lived out in every community. And how we treat other people matters to God deeply. In Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 7, the Lord our God does not tolerate, does not tolerate perverted justice, partiality, or taking of bribes. And of course, we know the latter. You know, we know it. I'm not so sure we always act upon that. Partiality is really a, an older word for discrimination. It's, uh, it's, it's to treat a different person because of their color, because of their gender, because of their 
caste or community differently than I would think of my own. And, and this is exactly what God's word says about it, that partiality. And, and I get it. it is, it's complicated. There, there's no way one sermon, not a, a month of sermons, is going to really address this issue. But on this particular day, I just want to... I want us to begin to think differently. I want us to begin to lean into the things that we know that we need to correct so that all things can be new. How many of you know that there's a time of repentance before God brings new things? Amen? You know, our miracles and all of what God wants is on the other side of your and I's faithfulness and obedience to him. Our ability to live out the vocation of, of reconciliation to all mankind. Not to just one part that I like, but that other part that I'm not so comfortable with, I get to leave that. I, you, we don't get to make that decision. And there's obviously different degrees of prejudice. It, you know, and I just want us to just think it through a little bit. Uh, this stuff is not easy to talk about, but it needs to be talked about. So we're addressing it. We're praying about these things. You know, obviously at the bottom, in terms of prejudice, it's one, the person who's a racist, the one that bullies and discriminates and the one who's vocal about it, who's intentional about it. And the next level would be that person who's a bigot, who believes, you know, stereotypes and, and belittles people for their condition, even when their condition was not made up of their own decision-making. The next would be the avoider, the uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable with other people because they, you know, they, they're, they come from a different economic class. They, they come from a, a different community. They, again, it's, it's the way that we look at things. We tend to sometimes avoid. The other kind is the person who might be insensitive to what hurts other people in particular. It's one thing to say that I'm not aware, but... The truth of it is too many of us choose not to be aware of the needs of those who are around us. And that's a prejudice. Apathetic. And it's easy to get to a place where we get frustrated, where we just don't care anymore. You know? Where it's, it's too big of a problem. It's not my issue. Whether that's in governance, whether that's... what I mean, we can think about it. When there's a problem in the church or whatever, we always pretend like, well, that's not, that's not for me to, get, to, to pray about. That's not for me to help solve. That's, that's the pastor. That's, you know, this. Apathetic. And the other person kind of goes up and better, sensitive, kind, inclusive. You know, when there's somebody that has a need round about them, they silently kind of reach out and help meet that need. They're, they're one that'll... Give a pat on the back and, and give a word of affirmation. They're sensitive. They're aware. And, of course, where we all want to be, and I believe that we all need to be, where God wants us to be is a reconciler, an active bridge builder. And I'll tell you, that there's no nation that becomes great unless there are people like this that make it happen, who choose to be a bridge builder. Even when you don't get it or even understand it, you show up, and as I've said many times, so much of success comes to just showing up. And so we show up in somebody's life or a need or whatever it may be, and you'll never know what God can do and will do until you say yes and show up. And so much of it is just that. And, and let, my, let me say this, you know, as we look at that list, and if you pop up the next screen and they're all up there, I, I want to say, you don't get to decide where you're at in this list. Because in our own personal prejudices, we don't choose ourselves where we sit in that list. That's for others to be able to help counsel. And this is, again, why in God's wisdom that he draws us into the family so that in a family and as a family that we get to learn one from another. We get to grow in one another. We get to participate with things together. You know, prejudice questions God's creation, and we need to understand that, that God, you know, he didn't make a mistake when he made different kinds of people. <laughs> I don't look like you, you don't look like me, you don't look like your neighbor, and that's a really good thing. It's a God thing. That he created every one of us uniquely. Every one of us, he says, are uniquely and wonderfully made. And it's a blatant expression of pride or arrogance, conceit, narcissism, whatever it may be, when we begin to think we know better than God. 
But somehow he made a race or a people, and just because they're different than me, I'm somehow better than, or... Acts chapter 17, verse 26. From one man, Adam, God made every nation, you could say family of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places from where they should live. And, and you know, I would just say there that first and foremost, God loves diversity. I, I can't answer the why. Because when I, my mind starts thinking about the why, I begin to get a little prejudice in my own thinking. I really do. I begin to say, well, what, what was it, Father, that you caused one person to be born in a poorer village in Bihar and you caused me to be born in Minneapolis, Minnesota? And there's massive differences, isn't there? You know, and I began to think about the equality of that, the, the justice of, uh, you know, and that's where our minds begin to go. But the truth of it is you and I need to come to a place of acceptance and, and faith and understand that God in his design and in all of what he loves and has done is that he has this amazing love towards everybody and no matter where they're placed, there's a possibility of freedom, life, and success in that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, who says that you're better than others? And what do you have that was not given to you by God? And if it wasn't given to you, why do you brag as if you did not receive it as a gift? You see, ultimately, we're all part of this nation. Every one of us has this place where God has planted us, planted us with purpose and with this idea that we would live a life in him and through him so that his love could be put on display. And every time we are prejudiced, every time we look at somebody else, whether it's undeserving or whatever it is that we've made up in our mind, we limit what God really desires to do. And when we fail to love what God loves... I think we fail to truly engage in that love as his kids. And of course, what God loves is the whole human race. And that's why in, as Jesus is going, he gives us, you know, the great commission. There are four other commissions, but the great commission is that we would go throughout all the earth and make disciples. And that is your and I's responsibility. It, it's, it's what's given to us to break down prejudices. It's, it's given to you and I so that no matter where, these, where people are in God's creation, given to us that we would lean into it. And I would just say, again, prejudice is a sign of, of ignorance. It, it, it means I don't know what I'm talking about. It reveals foolishness. It, it's, it's, it's as if to say that I don't really truly understand or have yet to, to apply myself to God's purposes. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 11, whoever hates his brother or is, is in darkness and, and walks around in the darkness, he does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. And on the other hand, as we grow in, in wisdom, as we become wiser uh, towards things, we get James 3.17, true wisdom from above is pure, it's peaceful, and it's gentle, it's friendly, it's full of compassion, and is free from prejudice and hypocrisy. And see, here's the difference between the two. Knowledge can set you up for success, but knowledge in itself can be a massive trap. When we grow into the knowledge and we begin to understand and we set ourselves onto knowledge to use it in particular to, to think somehow I'm better than, I'm greater than, or I'm above other people. Knowledge will help you pass an exam, but, but real wisdom, and I hope you can see this, it has everything to do with relationships. Everything, every one of those words that we read here in James chapter three, true wisdom is, is, is peaceful, it's gentle, it's friendly. This is what we practice. And so even for all of us who have a knowledge of the word of God, but have failed to live it out in compassion, to be friendly to our neighbor, to be more patient and understanding to those that are around about us, that's wisdom. Knowledge will never be enough. 
And it's wisdom that delights the Lord. And I just would hope and pray that we think more about that. That we lean into the fact that God has given us his word, his promises, and it's not there to be legalistic and judgmental. It's there that we might be a gift to somebody else to help them understand that there is a heavenly father who would never quit on them. And no matter what their human condition would take them to a new place, a high place of blessing in him, it describes in Ephesians chapter one. But in God's wisdom, and, and again, we could try to figure it out, but I don't. God has chosen you and I to put his love on display. He's chosen you and I to grow in not just knowledge, but the practitioner of wisdom so that we can be that person who would help people walk into the newness of God. There is no question that prejudice gets in the way of us fulfilling the great commission. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, the entire law is summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if instead of showing love, you attack and tear each other apart, well, watch out, because you yourself will be destroyed. You know, and this is the thing, you know, again, the people that were smart, the ones that had knowledge of the law, the Sadducees and Pharisees, asking a follow-on question, trying to trip up Jesus. Look at what he says, who's my neighbor? And of course, we get this beautiful parable or narrative of the Good Samaritan. And although I don't have time today to unpack that story, we, we know it well, that your neighbor is anybody that God brings in your path that day, who brings you into a path where you get a, a choice to, to love, to engage, to be a doer of the word or for whatever reason, not because of our prejudices or because of our time. It's a lot of things. You know, just for me, my own internal conflict, this is Scott's conflict. You know, as we drive in the road and I do most of my driving pretty well, I think, for the most part. <laughs> yeah, that's another story. We come to an intersection and there are people there begging, they're transacting, they're trying to, and you know, you, and you read the kind of the story and part of my mind goes, well, you know, this is kind of organized and people are, you know, this, and if there's kids, it's, you know, and I almost try to talk myself out of being generous. Does that make sense? And there's conflict because I look at it and already I'm prejudiced to things. Part of my prejudice is what I've learned, it's knowledge, and part of my prejudice is my own ignorance because I really don't know the situation. But I have to say out of real conviction, at the end of the day, the Father doesn't want me to stop being generous no matter what. It's not up to me. It's not up for you to always be an examiner of the soil. It's up to you and I to continue to sow God's seed. And if we have questions about it, let us err on the side of generosity and love and not on not participating. And, and this is the place where all of us need to get to when we look even at our own Neighbors, the one that lives right next door to us that we've never said hello to in five years. But it's, of course, more than that. And this is why I think there's such parallels into what you and I receive in terms of the love of the Father drawn into a family to respons responsible citizenship in a nation like India that has afforded you and I freedoms like no other country on planet Earth, and that's the truth. There is, I've been to over 160 countries. I have ministered in over 135 countries. Uh, I've, I've seen a good chunk of the world and I'll tell you that India's freedoms are unique and special. You don't, that constitution that you, we all benefit from, it's, I, I get that it's not always enforced in equality. Uh, I get that how it, get, it plays out sometimes, there's, it's not always just but the document of itself, its original 395 articles is amazing. The fact that you and I not only have freedom of worship, you and I have every right to propagate our faith. That does not exist in much of the world. But how do you and I continue to engage and continue to be a part of not just the family of God, but to bring the family of God to those round about us? And first and foremost, we need to overcome our prejudices 
Because, it, it, you know, in, in James chapter 2, verse 9, it says, if you treat people according to their outward appearance, you are guilty of sin, and God condemns you as a lawbreaker. You know, that prejudice probably is the most common sin in the world, bar none. And if we're honest today, we're all guilty of it a bit. I, I know I am. I'm much more inclined to hang out and, with people I know and like than the ones that I don't really know and don't like. And again, there, there's acquaintances, there's friends, there's deep spirited friends. I'm not talking about all the time, but, but how is this world ever going to know the love of the Father if you and I don't choose to be friends to somebody else? If we don't choose to love the unlovable, if you and I don't give time to the people that don't fit within my box of social status, of political persuasion, or in the time of my day, and I just say that because of the way that we think about things and our own prejudices, we fail to be part of the reconciliation power that God affords you and I. In Romans 14, 10, so why do you judge your brother and why do you think that you're better than he is? We will all stand before God one day and he's gonna judge us all. That ought to just be a wake up call. <laughs> it puts a little fear in you. It puts a little fear in me, I can tell you that. So the question is, how do we root out our prejudice from our lives? And again, these are complex issues. They're, you know, all of us have stories around this as we think about it in the Indian context. You know, every one of us have, you know, I mean, we're challenged to do the right thing all the time. And whether that's, you know, seeing two people, I love the, the testimony that was wonderful, beautiful, the way that God shaped a marriage and so forth, but... Getting married in this, in this country is complex. Is it at the same community? This cast, am I going to give money? Am I, it, 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 there's nothing easy to it. I, I, you know, I, I better not drift into family stories because I'll get myself in trouble. But we all understand this. But, you know, we need to see people as God sees them. That's number one. That's the biggie. We just have to... You know, like Paul prayed, I hope we could all see with the eyes of our heart rather than just the eyes of prejudice, the way that people on the out, outer appearance. You know, I think the good news is we as believers, we in the church of Jesus Christ, we believe that change is possible, amen? <laughs> There's anybody that believes in the power of change. It's the message of the gospel that can change a person's heart in an instant, in a moment. And that's such wonderful about the message of the gospel. It truly is good news. And yet on the backdrop of that, even as much as we believe it and confess it and understand that there is no better news on the planet than the love of God that is found in a person called Jesus Christ and that a life's trajectory could be forever changed. But how many of us get up every day to be that witness? How many of us, if we're honest, get up every single day thinking about how do I love my neighbor? How do I really be a part of the mission of reconciliation that the Father has? In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord does not look at the things man looks like. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. And I think part of our problem and our inability to see people as God sees people is that we come to our own judgments really quick. I mean, there's study after study. In the first 30 seconds, you're with somebody new and you see their appearance, you smell it the way that they, you know, the, the body odor, and you just give them, you know, a sentence or two and you've already brought your conclusion of the way you like them. Do they fit in? Are they gonna be a part of my circle? This is a, <laughs> and we do, right? And we oftentimes very quickly subconsciously or otherwise, come to conclusions that are not consistent with God's word and what he desires of you. And we remind of Jesus' words in John 7, 24, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judge. In other words, don't be shallow. And can I just say that seeing like God is not being colorblind? You know, this is, you know, more so in in America and other places where we have this tension between black and white and, and Latino and it, it just goes on and on. But we do the same thing here. Light skin, dark skin, this dinner, dinner. We, we, we do it, if we're honest, right? 
and the, what the Father expects is, is that we're going to be more patient with people because love is patient. Love is kind, right? <laughs> or it needs to be, ought to be in, in all of our life. But the truth of it is we get anxious. We get into a hurry. And we fail then to, to listen. We, we fail to do the things that we know we need to do. You know, I have numerous friends um, who are black. They're African-American. And, and I can tell you absolutely, they don't want you to be colorblind. I, I, I hear people sometimes say, I, when I look at people, I'm colorblind. I don't, I don't see their color. Well, yes, we do. You absolutely do, and you ought to. And still make the choice to love. And still make the choice to accept. And make the choice to not to be prejudiced because of what you're looking at. Amen? And that's what he expects. And we, men, we need to do this better when we look at the other gender, by the way, as well. All right? To not be prejudiced. And this is the way that healthy relationships are built with our Heavenly Father, with our spouse, with our family. And this is the way to building nations with equality that and this is what pleases the father in Acts chapter 10 verse 28 then it's just so listen this is important okay because this has existed from the beginning of time since God created human beings there was prejudices right I think of Noah Noah could not stand the Ninevites right there ain't no way he's going. He says, if I go there, all you're going to do is save them and help them. That was his attitude towards the Ninevites. <laughs> he says, why would I want to see that happen to the people I don't like? And of course, God took care of Noah, right? And we all know that. Or Jonah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so there's story after story. And this story in particular of Peter, because Peter did not want to go to the Gentiles. He did not want to go to those who were not Jewish, right? Which is all of us. <laughs> he, and he was absolutely prejudiced. He says they don't deserve it before anybody else. And this is Acts 10, verse 28. Then Peter said to Cornelius' household, you know, Jewish law forbids us from associating with people of another race. And that was his initial life statement for a while. But, and I love this, but God has shown me that no race is inferior or unclean. Amen. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34, I now realize that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation or another family who fear him and would do what is right. And I think the first step that to help in changing us or putting us on a different trajectory is simply ask God to help us seeing people the way he sees them. To help all of us to see people differently. The second thing is that we just need to listen more than we talk. And when we listen, to listen to everyone with respect. Prejudice is always first the failure to listen, the failure to not want to understand, the failure to not stay patient with somebody. In, in Proverbs 18, 13, it is foolish and shameful to decide before knowing the facts. And in the today's English version, it says, listen before you answer, because if you don't, you're being stupid and insulting. And I, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. This is, this is a problem for your pastor. I don't listen as much as I need to. I'm always in a hurry or on an agenda and what have you. And I'm, unfortunately, it shows up sometimes even in my marriage. So as a lot of you know, Melody is back in the U.S. We do talk every day for over an hour, just about every day, morning and evening, and and we stay connected. But sometimes when she starts talking about like her shopping trips, I am, I'm, my mind is going somewhere different. And sometimes it's not even going into the right place. But if I just shut my mouth and listen, boy, life stays better. <laughs> I can tell you this in, in counseling, right? When you get somebody and they're angry, and they're often really angry because they're hurt about something. There's some offense, and, they're, and they just got this pent-up frustration, right? And, and, and they just need to unpack it, right? And so they're off, and it's tense, and it's animated, and it's loud, and it's, it's all of those things, right? 
Uh, let me give you three key words to just help you out in this process. Tell me more. And then you get it all over again. And you get more of the animation and whatnot. And pretty soon after two or three tell me more, well, the air is out of the balloon. The steam has been let loose. And now, now you can have a conversation. Now you can talk about the frustration or the pain or whatever it is. Man, that's free marriage advice, by the way. I mean, just, just throw that out there. <laughs> but it, if we just would listen to one another and hear their story and hear the things, you know, again, with some, some leaders um, doing an interview and, and hearing this, this person that had just come into the church and, and was a little frustrated. He says, you know, I, when I read the word of God, I see so much that's, that's possible. I, I see so much hope. I see, and, and I feel like I got all this new optimism about what things could be. But then I go into the church and I find something very different. And we've all had stories like this, right? Don't pretend you don't know what I'm saying right now. And behavior is everything. How you and I behave, how we operate in God's love. And I'm just saying, again, reminding people of a core value, if we can help people become or to, to belong before we ask them to become, to, to feel comfortable in our presence, no matter what, no matter what they represent, no matter what their background might be. We need to get over our racial and cultural president. Prejudices. And the only way that we're going to do that is see people for all God sees and begin to listen to everybody with respect. In James chapter 1, verse 19, everyone must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for human anger does not achieve God's righteous purpose. And righteousness and justice is one and the same thing. In 1 Peter 2, 17, show respect to the ones you like, no, we don't get that option. Show respect to everybody. And again, you know, I, I hope you like this. It's a core value of hope you see. We don't put people down because of their status, because of their faith, nothing. It's the love of God that brings men into repentance. You don't need to talk about somebody's wrong behavior. You need to talk about and point them to God's love and acceptance. And that's how we see change. That's how we see reconciliation. That's how we are going to continue to be how Jesus designed us to be. And finally, my third point is that we must love everybody the way Jesus does. And I get this. You know, this is easy to preach, hard to do. There ain't no doubt. And we all know this. John 15, 12, my commandment is this. Love each other as I've loved you. And how does God love? Unconditionally. Freely. Completely. Consistently and constantly. It's his love towards you and I. And so when we get, <laughs> this was kind of funny. Last night, I'm, I had a long week. Anyhow, I had a conference in Hyderabad. I flew to Delhi, spoke in a conference over there. I fly in last night, and I'm studying in there, and I'm looking in, and from where my chair is, I can look on, and two kids come into my yard, and everything's, my gates are locked. And there's two kids wandering around my backyard. And so I come out over there, and they got, they're looking for a cricket ball that they hit in my yard. Well, I had an opportunity to be frustrated and upset. And they go on to say, well, we've been knocking on your gate for a long time. Well, it's locked for a reason, Baba. <laughs> Everyday life, right? You get to choose to hang out with them a little bit, talk to them, introduce myself because I didn't know they were my neighbor, which is kind of sad, but it's true. It's just God will design things. And if, for me, just take that moment and stop my studying and just to hang with them for, it wasn't that long, but to put a smile on their face meant everything. And you and I get an opportunity to do that every day if we want to. You know, our witness is, you know, our life is going to be interrupted. But that's what love does. It allows it, allows yourself to be interrupted, to listen, to stay patient, to hang in there for people. And this is what I love about the opportunity God gives you and I. James 2 says, as believers in our Lord Jesus, we must never treat people in different ways just because of their outward appearance. Young, old, poor, rich, 
different gender. In James 2, 8, you'll be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom, which is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. We can never build a society without that kind of love. But there can be a nation that becomes truly great if we build our lives with that love. And this is what I love about the church because the church is God's plan to bring people together. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles. Some of us have been slaves, some of us are free, but we all have been baptized into one body through one spirit and have all received the same spirit. So all, I love the inclusiveness. Now all of you together are Christ's body. And each of you is a necessary part of it. Can you just see how important and how necessary we are to each other? And you're necessary wherever God's planted you, to whomever your neighbor might be, to whoever you're working with, going to school with. None of us are complete in ourselves. We only find our completion in Christ and our fellowship one with another. That's the essence of it. There's no question the biggest conflict, the reason why there's so much fracturing in the world is because people are still struggling with their own identity. I get this question more than any other question in counseling. What am I supposed to do? Who am I really? Every one of us are on a journey of purpose. And this is true with our life in Christ and it's true with our citizenship in a nation like India. Where do I fit in? How can I be a part of change? Where do I engage my love, my faith, my gifting? And it's what I love most about what the Father gives you and I, a brand new identity. Forgiven, set free, free to be all that he designed you to be. In Galatians 3, it says, so now, in other words, after you've been saved, if you've come, you are children, you're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in battle have been made like him. So there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free male or female, for you are all Christians, one in Christ Jesus. And so the only question for me today is, are you a part of that family? Have you decided to put your trust in Christ and the gifts that he would give? A brand new identity, a brand new destiny. I love that of the Father. Forever your name would be written in the Lamb's book of life and your tomorrow is forever secured. And I only bring that up because it's in that place, that surety, that confidence, that hopefully that we can find greater courage to love our neighbors to know that no matter what, that my tomorrow is taken care of because my identity is now found in Christ and his family, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, because I just don't have a knowledge of God's plan and purposes, I now have the wisdom to live it out. And that's where it really matters most, that you and I go from just knowing the Father to living out a life of love and confident witness because we know that we belong to his family. In Colossians chapter three, verse 11, in this new life, one's nationality or race or education or social position is unimportant. Such things mean nothing. Whether a person has Christ is what matters and he is equally available to all. I like that. Our faith is one of the most inclusive faiths there is. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Don't be ashamed of that love. Don't be ashamed of an identity in Christ. But never forget the responsibility you have in that family, the responsibility to where he's planted you in your citizenship. Both are important. Both matter to the Father. And it's a foundation. Jesus gave us the symbol to remind us of the unity and oneness, and it's the Lord's table. In a few moments, we're going to have communion together. And that word communion is, 
is all about community. And I love this about communion because it's something we get to do together. So not only do we trust God to do a new work on the inside of our hearts and to engage in that wonderful promise that he would remember my wrong no more and he would usher me into all things that, that are of him. there's people here I know that the Lord has been speaking to. Do you know that Jesus is real? You heard me talk about his love and his inclusivity and he would say to each and every one of us that he yearns to know us more and to have more of us. But maybe you're here today and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and I would just tell you it's the only way that we can get and engage with the love of the Father. He makes it clear if we could have confidence today to believe that Jesus was sent of the Father to live that life and to die a death for the sake of our sins so that we could live forever, if we could believe it in our heart, confess it with our mouth, I mean, just simply pray to ask Jesus to come into our hearts, that, to ask the Father to forgive us while well, all things become new. That is the gateway into the family of God. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you know that the Lord has been speaking to you, and you know today is the day that you put Jesus as the Lord of your life, just lift up your hand right now and say, Pastor Scott, pray for me. I want to be included in this final prayer. Thank you. Thank you for that hand in the back. Thank you. In the balcony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Church, we're just going to remain seated, but if you could, all of us together, pray this prayer and believe that God will do everything he's promised to do, that salvation will come. And it will, as we pray this prayer out loud together. Dear Heavenly Father, together out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. And I choose him today to be the Lord of my life. Father, forgive me of all my sin. And Jesus, come into my life to live forever as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, I declare I'm a child of God. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Jesus. I just pray that you continue to reveal yourself for each one who prayed that prayer for the first time or rededicated their life. Have your way with all of us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, it says that when we drink from the cup and that we ask God, God to bless. Isn't that shape sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we eat the bread that we break, isn't that sharing in the body of Christ? And by sharing in the same loaf of bread, we become one body, even though there are many of us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, Christ has made peace between Jews and Gentiles and making us all one people by breaking down the wall of hatred that separated us together. As one body, Christ reconciles both groups of God by means of his death and our hostility towards one another is put to death. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, now all of us may come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you, non-Jewers, who are no longer strangers and foreigners, you are citizens along with God's holy people. You are members of God's family. I hope we can lean into that language. I don't know where you come from. Maybe it's from another state, another town, a different village. To believe and to know that we're all welcome to come to this table so that he could build one heart and one purpose in all of us. We need one another. And as we come in during this time, I... I pray that you have all the faith in the world to come and ask God to forgive you, to put you on a new trajectory. But can we trust him to heal the broken relationships round about? Can we ask him to take away our lens of prejudices, our biases, our indifferences, to know that his table, at his table, all are welcome. In Romans chapter 10, verse 12, for there is no difference between Jew and John. In other words, believe, I'm, the, the same Lord is Lord of all and riches, richly blesses all who would call upon him. In verse John chapter 3, dear children, let us stop just saying that we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. 
It's by our actions that we know we are living by the truth. And we know this. We can't just be showing up for church on a Sunday. We can't just be going through the motions. We've got to lean into the love of God and let the love of God take care of us. It's more than a time of confessional. As we commune, as we come to the table together, I hope that we come with a heart that says, you know, Father, I want to be on mission with you. I want to be in love with what you love, and that's all of humanity. There are people that we all know that would need to be in the family of God. They need to be here. What are we going to do about it? Let's pray about that as we come to the Lord's table. John 13, verse 35, you, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. And this is, do we love what the Father loves today? And finally, in conclusion, in Ephesians chapter 2, reading out of verse 12 and 13. At that time, you did not know about Christ. You were foreigners to the people of Israel. You had no part in the promises of God that had made them. You were living in this world without hope and without God. You were far from God, but Christ, but Jesus offered his life's blood as a sacrifice and brings you near to God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for Calvary. We thank you for choosing to set us free and not just barely free, your word says, but abundantly free. Because indeed you've provided for everything. You've taken care of everything so that each one of us, Father, can find a new mercy in our morning, on our day today. Forgive us, Father, of our sin. Forgive us of our indifference. Forgive us, Father, for not loving our neighbor as we should. God, we want to not just lean into your family. We want to lean into this nation, a nation that needs you, a nation that, Father, needs to hear the hope of the gospel. So we come, Father come to your table asking you to forgive us, to change us, and to move us, Father. In Jesus' name. On that night when Jesus was in the upper room, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take eat in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and he lifted it up, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is my blood shed for you for the remission of sin. Take drink in remembrance of me. Uh, Father, again, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the freedom that we have through your love, through Jesus. Father, we give you thanks today for India, for this great, amazing nation that you love so much, we give thanks for. We ask that God that you'd help us participate more meaningfully, that we'd lean in and demonstrate that love more often than we have. God, we want to see our nation changed. Fulfilling its destiny, fulfilling its place, God. So let the righteous arise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Even as we close the service, want to join us as we sing the blessing in different Indian languages. And let's pray. Shine.